Okay, so good morning everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the genetic advances that we've seen in frontotemporal dementia recently. But genetics is quite a complicated um, subject, so I'm going to start by giving a little bit of background on what, on what the general terms um, related to genetics mean. So we, people talk about genes, talk about chromosomes, talk about DNA. So I'm going to try and give you a basic explanation of what those terms mean. And that might help us later on as we go through the talk. I'm then going to mention some of the genetic abnormalities that we find in frontotemporal dementia. And then finally talk about some of the practical implications. So first of all, how do we look for genes? And what happens if we find one? So to start with, what is genetics? Well, genetics is the field of study of genes. So it's concerned with how we pass on qualities from parents to their offspring. And these can be simple physical traits, such as height or hair color, but this can also um, encompass complex disease susceptibilities. So when we talk about genetics, we usually talk about medical genetics. And medical genetics is both a clinical specialty and a basic science. So what that means is, well, we have geneticists, and these are doctors of genetics. They can be clinical doctors, so doctors that we go to see in the clinic, but they can also be scientists that work in the lab. But the study of medical genetics makes it possible to gain a greater understanding of the function of health and disease in the human body. And we've seen a lot of advancements recently in genetics. And these allow us or create opportunities to help us understand, prevent, treat, and potentially cure human diseases. And the molecule of studies, what people study in genetics, is called the gene. But what exactly is a gene? So genes are found in all of the cells of our bodies. So we have hundreds and thousands of cells in our bodies. And genes are found within it. So genes are made up of these strands of DNA. And this, if you took the strands of DNA out and you pulled it out across, it would probably stretch from one end of the room to the other. But they're coiled up within the cell in tightly, tightly coiled into what's called chromosomes. So we have a chromosome which is a length of DNA. So that's all a chromosome is. And these lengths of DNA are then split up into different units called genes. And each gene looks slightly different and it has a different, um, it does different things. So it's, in a nutshell, that's what genes, DNA and chromosomes mean. And as I said, they're all found within these cells. So it's really quite extraordinary. So but what do genes do? So we all know that genes can just tell us whether we have freckles. They control what color our eyes will be. And we even know that genes can determine how angry we could become. <laughs> but how do they do this? So they do this by producing um, units called proteins. So the size and code of the gene, so as I said, each gene is slightly different. And the size and the code of the gene determines the size and the characteristics of the protein. So why are proteins important? So proteins are like the recipe book of the cell, or sorry, genes are like the recipe book of the cell. They provide the instructions of how to make the proteins. And the proteins are the most important unit within our bodies because they are the building blocks of cells. They determine what the cells look like, they regulate reactions, they perform their enzymes, and they're also hormones. We've all heard of hormones. We have the thyroid hormones, thyroxin, we have estrogen, testosterone, and these are all actually proteins. Another example of a protein is the hemoglobin unit. So I just thought I'd put this up here. I'm sure everyone's heard of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin um, carries the oxygen around our cells. So it's extremely important. And there are a number of genes um, which are responsible for producing this protein. So to move on then, where do we get our genes from? So if you remember, we said that genes are, or chromosomes are coiled up DNA and they are made up of a number of different genes. In actual fact, there's about 20,000 genes. Um, and we have 46 chromosomes. So 46 coils of DNA containing genes, and they're arranged in pairs. And within the pair, we get one 
chromosome from our mother and one chromosome from our father. So we have these two chromosomes and they actually contain identical <coughs> genes. But one comes from our mother and one comes from our father. And how does this get passed on to us? So we have our two genes from our dad and our two genes from our mom. They replicate before they, um, as a process um, involved in fertilization. So these double. And uh, when they double, they combine a little bit, and that's to make sure that our genes are diverse um, and it allows for genetic diversity within the population. They then split from each other into four separate chromosomes, and one from each, one from the mother and one from the father, then um, develop in the embryo. So here we can see we have a mixture of genetic material. Essentially, it's all come from mum and dad, but it looks different to mum and dad's. But sometimes this goes wrong. So sometimes when the genetic material is being passed on from our mum or dad, um, abnormalities happen. So I don't want you to worry too much about these slides, but just to show that sometimes a little bit of the gene can be deleted, sometimes a little bit of the gene can be duplicated, sometimes something extra can be added into the gene, and sometimes the gene can be expanded so it becomes longer than it should be. So those are just some of the abnormalities that can, go, that can happen. But how do we inherit our genes? So we know that we get one from our mother, one from our father. One chromosome from our mother, one chromosome from our father. And each pair of chromosomes contain identical genes. So say, for example, your mother has blue eyes, your father has brown eyes. But we don't have one blue eye and one brown eye. Something else has to happen um, to determine whether we will get the brown eyes from our mother or the blue eyes. And that depends on, how the on characteristics of the gene. There's lots of different ways it can be inherited. But what really relates to FTD in the most common form is autosomal dominant. So that means that one of those genes is dominant over the other. So I'm just going to talk you through this. So say, for example, this father has an abnormal gene. OK, that, and that's here you can see the chromosomes. And you can see in the blue, this is his abnormal gene. And the mother has two normal genes. So the father will give one chromosome to the children and the mother will give one. So you can see there's a 50% chance that this father will pass on the abnormal chromosome to some of his children. So in a nutshell, that is autosomal dominant inheritance. Just to recap, you get one mutated copy of the gene in each cell and that's sufficient for a person to be affected by an autosomal dominant disorder. Each affected person usually has one affected parent. And autosomal disorders usually occur in every um, generation of a family. So I just want you to kind of try and keep this in mind as we go through the genetic mutations in FTD. I just want to briefly mention another form of inheritance, which is autosomal recessive. In this case, you need to have two abnormal copies of the gene, like this child down here. The mother and father have one abnormal copy each, but they're normal because this gene isn't dominant. So the normal gene is dominant over the abnormal gene here. So in this case, only one in four of their children will be affected. Two will carry the gene, and one will be completely unaffected. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK. But so I want to introduce here the geneticist. Because, as John said, the geneticist is really important in all of these processes. So although we, we know how genes are inherited, and we know about autosomal dominant inheritance, the geneticist will have a few caveats to add on this. So they will tell us that it's important to note that the chance of passing on a genetic condition applies equally to each pregnancy. So say, for example, a couple has a child with an autosomal dominant disorder. They carry this autosomal dominant gene the chance of having another child with the gene is still 50%. So it's completely, cha it's completely chance. Um, so if you have a child with abnormal, an abnormal gene, it doesn't protect future children from getting the abnormal gene. And the same if you have a child without, a normal gene, without 
the abnormal gene, it doesn't mean that future children will definitely carry the gene. So the geneticist will also tell us that although the chances of inheriting a genetic condition appear straightforward, there are lots of other factors involved in determining who will, whether, who will get the gene and who will develop the condition. And they will also tell us that some people with a disease causing mutation never develop any health problems or may experience only mild symptoms. If we know that a family or condition seems to run in the family, but it's not a clear inheritance pattern like we talked about the autosomal dominant or the recessive, then predicting the chance of somebody else within the family developing the disorder can be very difficult. So the next question is, is FTD genetic? Well, we know that frontotemporal dementia has a strong familial basis in about 20% of cases. When we say a strong familial basis, we mean a strong family history in at least one family member who has, is a first degree relative. So a first degree relative isn't a distant cousin. A first degree relative is a mother, father, brother, sister, or aunt or uncle. Um, and usually there's a family history of FTD, but if not, sometimes it's a family history of motor neuron disease, like John mentioned earlier, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And we're going to talk about one gene in particular that can occur in a very small proportion of cases that doesn't seem to have any family history. So do we know which genes are involved in FTD? The, good, the, the answer is yes, um, we know most of them which is great, and this has really been a relatively new advancement. So the most common gene is the C9R72 mutation, and that's what I'm going to concentrate on. Um, we also know about other mutations. This is the tau mutation. So as John mentioned, this mutation causes the um, laying down of abnormal tau protein. And also we see another mutation called progranulin, and it causes laying down of the abnormal TDP43 protein. But what do we know about our patients who come to the clinic? And how common are these genes in our patients? Well, if we consider, apologize for the um, acronym, but BVFTD, so the behavioral variant of frontotemporal dementia. And this is the most hereditary of all the FTD conditions. So let's take all of our patients with this condition, regardless of family history. We know that only 2% of these patients will have a tau mutation. We know that another 5 or 6% will carry a progranulin mutation. But this is the proportion of patients who carry the C9ORF72 mutation. So this is over 30%. And this is, isn't considering those just in fam with a family history. But this is considering the whole cohort. So you can imagine when this gene was discovered, you know, just really the interest that it caused. It was um, really remarkable. So then we looked at familial behavioral variant in frontotemporal dementia. So patients who have um, a family history or a strong family history, like we mentioned. And here, look at how common the C9 or 72 mutation is. Almost 50% of cases. So to tell you a little bit more about the mutation, so this was only discovered in 2011, and it is the commonest genetic cause of frontotemporal dementia and motor neuron disease. It's located on chromosome 9. So um, you remember all those chromosomes? You remember the set of 23 chromosomes? Um, they're each just given a number, so 1 to 23, and just, this gene is found on chromosome 9. And this gene provides instructions for making the protein called TDP43. So think back to the function of the genes for making proteins. And this gene makes this protein TDP43. But for some unknown reason, and um, this is what part of our research is trying to figure out, the gene causes abnormal or causes a buildup of this protein, but not in the right places, in all of the wrong places. And this causes death within the cells. And then we see shrinkage, like John showed on the MRI scan. And importantly, this appears to be an autosomal dominant condition. But just remember those caveats from the geneticist. We don't know that everybody who will carry the gene will develop 
the, this mutation. And this has been some of my work that I've been involved in, is trying to characterize these mutation carriers. We want to do this so we can identify people early, and we send people for genetic testing when it's appropriate. So in this group of conditions, patients have a very strong family history of motor neuron disease. And that really it has really cemented the overlap between the two conditions. We've always known that frontotemporal dementia and motor neuron disease are related. The discovery of this gene really provides strong, robust evidence for their link. What is motor neuron disease? Well, it's also known as MND, and it results in progressive weakness of the limbs. It also affects the muscles of speech and swallow, and also muscles of breathing are affected. And as John mentioned, this um, has a negative impact on survival when it develops in patients with frontotemporal dementia. On the other side, as John said, patients with motor neuron disease can develop frontotemporal dementia. Or sorry, on the other side, patients with frontotemporal dementia can go on to develop motor neuron disease. And we, if they do, we usually see that in the first few years of their presentation. So I haven't talked about tau and progranulin genes here. Um, if you want to talk about it, maybe come up and talk to me later. I just didn't want to complicate things too much. Um, but why is it important to study genes? Well, it provides information for the doctors, information for people who carry the gene, and importantly, information for their families. And it allows them to make informed decisions about their future. It's very important for research because as we have learnt, hopefully today, that all patients with a certain genetic abnormality have the same protein abnormality. So this allows us to learn more about the proteins and potentially find a way to treat these proteins and stop their buildup. It can help us develop markers of the disease to assess survival and progression, because it's very important when people come to us with their loved ones to help them plan for the future um, and determine how long this condition will last and um, what will its progress be. Importantly, it will help us develop markers of early features of the disease and hopefully when we develop efficient drug treatments, these are the people that we want to target, those who have early disease. So finally, I just want to mention some of the practical implications. So how do we look for genes and what happens um, when we find one? So when people come to the research center, we will invite everyone to have blood taken for genetics. Everyone who agrees will have blood taken for the C9 ORF expansion, because as I said, that is found in a very small proportion of patients with no known family history, but it's small. If on the other hand, you do have a strong family history, we will also test for some of the other mutations. Just to reiterate, a positive finding without a family history is rare. Blood is only taken after informed consent, whether that is from the patient or from the carer. And it takes a number of months to get these results back. We will then send you a letter um, letting you know the results. And you'll already have met Lauren, who will have taken the blood. And she will then contact you via letter to let you know the results. Because this is a research lab, if we find something that looks abnormal, we send it off to a clinical laboratory um, for, to confirm it. But we can't just send it off to a clinical laboratory. We have to involve this man again, the geneticist, or woman. I tried to find a picture of a female doctor, but I couldn't find, I, I couldn't find an appropriate one. So, um, As I said, this, in this case, the geneticist is a medical doctor. And they work within a team so in close association with the genetic counsellor. What they'll do is they'll confirm the findings if they're positive. But very importantly, they will offer genetic counselling. And that's to make sure that both patients and their family members are aware of all the positive and negative implications involved in having a genetic diagnosis. The good news is the genetic consultation is free. Um, and they offer three sessions usually. So the first session, you will go along and you will have a chat about the implications of genetic testing, what that means. It'll depend on what stage of life you're at. It can have implications for insurance. It can obviously have implications for careers. 
Um, so you'll have a chat, you'll go away and think about it, they'll invite you back. If you decide you want to have the testing, they will take the blood, and then they will invite you back at a later date with the results. So all in all, this takes about six to 12 months, so it's not a fast result. And the reason they, this is intentional, because they want to be sure that people are aware of the implications and they've truly thought about the process. In actual fact, about two thirds of people who go for testing in the end decide against it. But it's still worthwhile to have gone and have had that initial consultation and just know where you stand and you can always change your mind in the future. You don't just get one chance at it, you can go back. And as I said, it's useful to discuss implications. And this is really important for family members of people who have already developed the condition. If you've developed the condition, it has less impact on insurance and career. But if you're a family member and you might carry the gene, well, I think it's important to figure out where you want to go with this. And there are some positives to finding out genetic status for um, family members of um, affected relatives, especially those who are at childbearing age, because there is now a process where, called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. And this is an IVF process, so, like, so similar to IVF. And in this process, it can allow you to choose embryos which don't have the abnormality within it. So you can ensure that you don't pass on this genetic defect to your offspring. So this is the process. So it's a similar IVF process where they stimulate the production of eggs the embryos are formed. They then take two or three cells from the embryo around day three or day five. They test them genetically. They then choose the embryos which are unaffected. And then, similar to IVF, they transfer um, and, and wait for implantation. This, unfortunately, isn't free at the moment. Um, there are some charities in Sydney who will offer financial assistance for it, but it is available in almost every state. And I think it's something which will become more available and hopefully um, less costly in the future. So seeing as you all know everything that I know now about genetics, that would have some multiple choice questions. No, I'm only joking. <laughs> so any questions for me?